Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Um, for those of you who are able, would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, we've got another terrific program for you today. It's a great pleasure to see um, so many friendly faces out there. Uh, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce my good friend and colleague, Vice President of AFIO, John Seno, who will introduce our first speaker. Good morning. Jim's uh, absolutely correct. This should be a fascinating day. And a great way to start off is on a topic that's been on a number of people's minds for probably almost 10 years now, the Nicholson case. And I think I can speak for just about everybody in the room. We're all sort of, I hate to use the word, contemporaries of him, but I was an East Asia Division officer at the same time Jim was. I never met him, <laughs> don't know him but we sort of you know, missed each other by six months or so. He was in the Philippines, then I was in the Philippines. He was in Thailand, then I was in Thailand, so. But we're here to, uh, I'm here to introduce Brian. Brian Denson is, is a veteran journalist. He writes for the, and I'm probably mispronouncing it, the Oregonian, all right, got it right. He specializes in what he called the, the hard to get stories. He's also written for magazines, including Maxim, Reader's Digest, and Running Time, so we've got a, a fair amount of diversity. He's won a number of national and regional journalism honors. Uh, he won the George Polk Award, the Michael E. DeBakey Journalism Award, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it's amazing, though, this is his first book. Uh, uh, I was doing some research on, on Brian the other night, and a website described his work as follows, and I quote, he often finds offbeat tales requiring investigative lockpicking, then drills deeply to immerse himself in the lives of his characters to reveal the soul of their stories. And I went on to the Oregonian website and read a couple of the, uh, the articles that led to this book, and it really is, it's, it's fascinating. He really gets into the heart and the mind of, of an operations officer and the family environment. So, He's also done work on a number of other uh, interesting articles. Uh, Scandal in the Government's Biggest Work Program for Disabled Americans. Uh, would he uh, pressurized the U.S. Air Force to, pressure the U.S. Air Force to rewrite deadly flight manuals. He also, and I love this one, he has shown how, to sm how a small town police department wrote a million dollars in speeding tickets in only six months on a patch of highway outside its jurisdiction. <laughs> Now, Brian, if you could let us know exactly where that stretch of highway is, because there are a couple of lead-footed colleagues here, I'm sure I want to avoid it. Um, so as I said, this, this, his first book, The, uh, the Spy's Son, uh, it's about Jim Nicholson and the efforts to recruit his own son into espionage. He drew on a number of FBI reports, court documents, military records, personal correspondence, and hundreds of hours of interviews with Jim's son, Nathan to tell this story. It has all the elements of a traditional spy thriller, but the fact that it is based in reality makes it all that more fascinating. And as a final note, Paramount Pictures is considering turning this into a movie with Robert De Niro playing the role of Jim Nicholson. <laughs> so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brian to the stage. I can't tell you how many groups of people I've uh, spoken to over the years and said, what an honor it is to be here. But I'm telling you, with this group, I really, really mean it for maybe the first time. <laughs> this is, I, I'm seeing names that I've only seen on, online and heard about uh, from other uh, uh, reporters, uh, uh, investigative reporters. And I have to tell you, um, the, um, uh, I had never heard of your organization until about five or six years ago when I started looking into the Nicholson spy cases, cases plural. Um, and I reached out to Steve Engelberg, who had been my uh, investigative editor at the Oregonian, 
Um, Steve had been a, an intelligence writer for the New York Times, uh, Pul Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, terrific guy, and I reached out and I said, what do I do to get into this? I mean, you know, nobody's talking about it. There's some court records, there's some court transcripts, I can get the kid to talk to me, trying to get to Jim, the Bureau of Prisons isn't helpful. Who do I talk to? He said, you gotta call the AFIO. So it happens, uh, the AFIO sort of reached out to me through Brian Kelly, um, who, um, uh, uh, may he rest in peace, um, reached out to me in 2000, 10 and said, look, I can see you're a little naive <laughs> on these matters. You're, you're, going, you're doing great stories. I'm teaching them at, at, uh, uh, at Texas A&M, which was my father's alma mater. Um, I immediately liked Brian and he took me under his wing and for the next few years um, uh, really uh, steeped me in the world that all of you have occupied in one form or another uh, for so long. And uh, I really am terribly honored uh, to be here. And Trish walking in. I've just been speaking about Brian. Thank you for being here. And I see Michelle as well. Uh, named in the book. A number of people in this room are named in the book. Uh, Mike Rochford, of course, and uh, uh, Michelle and Spike Bowman uh, are all, all in the book. Uh, there are a few of you who are mentioned in acknowledgments, and Daryl Charney, uh, not, uh, David Charney, sorry, um, is, uh, is in the book as well. Somewhere here I have a clicker. There it is. In the annals of American espionage, Jim Nicholson holds four superlatives. He's the, as the rather longish subtitle to the book suggests, he's the, uh, the highest ranking CIA officer ever convicted of espionage. He's also the only uh, two-time turncoat. Um, and uh, as uh, I think Dave Major uh, uh, and Michelle have both called him the, the double hitter, um, he's also the only spy to have uh, accomplished uh, espionage-related crimes from behind the bars uh, of a U.S. prison. Um, but more interestingly to me, um, those are all fascinating superlatives, but the fourth one that I really love is the fact that this is the first, the first investigation, which was, uh, they rolled Jim up in 1996, and I'll give you the highlights for some of you who don't know it. Um, they, um, um, they actually conducted a spy versus spy operation under the roof at Langley. Uh, in, the, in the original building and in, in the counterterrorism center. Uh, it was then the counterterrorist center, as I understand it. Um, and so I was really um, looking for someone. Nathan, obviously, is the protagonist of the second half of the story, which is, you know, being recruited by his own father uh, to carry messages to the Russians. But I really needed some individual who could stand in as the protagonist for that that more interesting part of the case. And I found several people who fit that bill and, 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 and serve as sort of junior varsity protagonists. But I had to find one person who you sort of cared about. And this was uh, John McGuire, who uh, was a CIA officer who had spent 14 years in espionage and ultimately um, wound up uh, getting himself into uh, uh, a bit of trouble with his uh, station chief. I'll get into that in a minute. Um, and actually the head of the Near East Division. Um, but let me tell you first about Jim Nicholson just a little bit. Um, he was, um, in, he came from a military family, um, uh, steeped in patriotism, charming, cunning, good looking. Um, uh, I think uh, John McGuire described him as not like a lot of the schlubs in the CIA. Pardon me, folks. Um, <laughs> Army captain, uh, ROTC scholarship, um, married at 22, father at 28, three children, oldest Jeremy, middle child uh, Astralina, star uh, Nicholson and of course Nathan uh, born in uh, Manila Jim's first um, overseas uh, station um, in 1984. Uh, Jim many of you may have know the story of Batman but he was nicknamed Batman um, by his station chief there in Manila uh, in the early 80s. Uh, by 40 uh, he became the CIA's station chief in Bucharest um, Christmas Day, the Soviet Union collapses. Uh, uh, Christmas Day, 91, the Soviet Union collapses. So does his marriage uh, right about that time. Um, Jim's wife <laughs> um, is, has been described as a bit of a Miss Moonbeam character from Oregon. There's a lot of sort of granola girls out there, and, and Jim married one. Um, and uh, she got worn out by his uh, total blind devotion to the agency um, and his frequent absences without explanation. And I know that's not a, a new story here. Uh, that can happen, but he also um, was a serial adulterer. And uh, to hear her say it, uh, he got the maid pregnant uh, in Manila 
um, that did pass around the station, as I understand it, that story. Uh, he had an affair with his interpreter while working cross-border ops um, between uh, uh, Thailand and Cambodia uh, in the next, uh, and then ultimately, um, Lori decided to have an affair on her, <laughs> of her own and uh, started dating the, uh, the veterinarian at, uh, in uh, Bucharest uh, just before the big split, and this made Jim incensed. Um, apparently, the veterinarians make house calls there. Um, <laughs> so I didn't know that. Uh, at any rate, um, there's a huge um, showdown in the Nicholson home. They, they decide to split. Lori takes the three children back to the United States, and uh, Jim um, ultimately is reassigned uh, as a, a deputy uh, a COS um, in um, Kuala Lumpur, um, Malaysia. Um, he begins this very messy uh, divorce, and um, he's angry at his ex. He's angry at his country. He's not quite as angry at himself, and I think there was a bit of misplaced anger, but um, he uh, could have gone to the CIA for help, and people have asked me for years, you know, why didn't he just go get help? And I know that this can cause you some trouble in your career, but if, if you look at the, the damage created by the decision not to go to the CIA for some help, um, it's, uh, it's uh, unfathomable to me. Um, Anyway, he, at, during a routine meeting uh, in uh, uh, Kuala Lumpur, he goes to meet the resident uh, in the, um, uh, then the Russian Federation's, um, the SVR, and um, volunteers. He's a walk-in, and he asks, he says, I, I, I'm in trouble. Um, I'm going, they're going to, first off, they're going to send me back to the farm, uh, and the uh, resident said, you know, what did you do wrong? And he said, um, he said, I'm in trouble. I got this divorce, and I got, I got to straighten it out. I need $25,000. And from that moment on, of course, he's walked through a door that he can't walk back out of. And uh, so um, he takes the money, excuse me, and um, begins turning over some of our uh, nation's uh, most uh, cherished secrets, uh, including uh, ultimately the names of uh, 300 uh, career trainees at, at, uh, at the farm. Uh, some of whom he trained himself, and a number of them were, were Knox. So uh, not good, um, bad guy, um, and uh, so one of the more interesting parts of the whole Nicholson matter was the fact that he volunteered <laughs> shortly after the arrest of Oliver James. And um, he actually sat in an interview after his arrest talking to Katie Couric, and she said, Aldrich Ames, and then you do it? And he said, well, I thought there might be a, an opening. I mean, how naive can you be? Even I'm not, I'm not in your world. I'm just, I'm an interloper. But even I know that there are always multiple penetrations, always multiple chances to get caught. It was just an insane thing to say. I don't even know if he actually meant it. Um, the, uh, so I, what I'm going to do is I want to start off by reading, I mentioned uh, this John McGuire character. Um, I, I don't know if any of you actually know him. Um, he's sort of a, a, a bigger than life character. Um, and uh, he serves to tell uh, much of the story from inside uh, the agency. He was the, the guy, the spy working against Jim. It begins Langley, Virginia, summer 1996. John McGuire sat in a cubicle village on the second floor of CIA headquarters, a clean, well-carpeted place full of file cabinets and misery. After 14 years of exciting spy work, he now labored in utter obscurity in a pool of human resources mopes. McGuire had spent most of his years in the agency on the front lines of the Cold War, although more recently he labored as a counterterrorism operative in the Middle East. He had served in such garden spots as El Salvador, Honduras, Lebanon, and Iraq. And now it was abundantly clear that at 42, his once promising career in espionage was over. McGuire had gotten crossways with his boss, the Near East Division Chief, for refusing to take an overseas posting in Karachi, Pakistan. His penance was a position in HR in the bowels of the CIA's original headquarters building, part of the agency's sprawling, highly secured compound in the Langley community of McLean, Virginia. There, he drank sweetened coffee and pushed pencils amid the agency's plebes, pouring through the personnel files of other CIA officers to determine those worthy of promotions. He found it disheartening to labor through the applications of agency employees who, unlike himself, might actually be promoted. 
McGuire's ennui was broken from time to time by the prank calls of colleagues still performing actual spy work. Some disguised their voices to ask about their promotions packets before busting a gut. Others phoned to make such helpful declarations as, you're so fucked. One day in the spring of 1996, McGuire's phone rang and he heard the voice of Anna, the secretary, the secretary of the Near East Division. Anna was a powerful figure in the division, something of an aging Miss Moneypenny, and as part of the senior secretarial pool, she enjoyed the oblique horsepower of her division chief. When Anna called, you paid attention. When you needed help, she was your oracle. Need to proof check an official memo? She poured over it, caught your errors. Need to reach an overseas leader? A business figure, someone at the White House? She had the number. Screw up badly? She dressed you down, leaving you standing with your shoes smoking as if you'd been struck by lightning. Anna was a striking, statuesque woman with raven hair. All the senior secretaries in the CIA had juice. If they liked you, they could make your life easier. Anna seemed to like McGuire. How are you doing, she asked. I'm trying not to kill myself in my seat, he said. Come upstairs, he heard her say. Don't tell anybody where you've gone. Just leave your desk and come up here to me right now. All right. Like so many times in his career, McGuire could only imagine the fresh patch of hell in front of him. He had served seven years as a cop in his native Baltimore, then 14 more as a spy. He understood the swift, decisive nature of upper management bureaucrats whose sudden decrees often fell into subordinates' laps like hot coals. McGuire hauled his six foot three, 195 pound frame out of his chair and slipped away quietly. He caught an elevator to the sixth floor, one level below the penthouse of power where the director of central intelligence runs the show. There, outside his boss's door, he found Anna at her desk. She steered him into the office and the door closed. He stood in front of a familiar wooden desk behind which sat Steve Richter, whom he had never seen without a suit and tie. Richter, a key part of the Directorate of Operations, the CIA's clandestine wing, oversaw spy operations across the Middle East. McGuire thought his boss was one of the smartest and most talented of the agency's senior intelligence officers and also one of the most vindictive. I'm skipping ahead just slightly here. McGuire's boss, not known for warm and fuzzy moments with subordinates, didn't invite him to take a seat. It would be a short meeting. I have an assignment for you, Richter said. I can't tell you anything about it. He told McGuire that he needed an answer then and there and that a yes would be good for his career. If he said no, all he had to do was go back downstairs and never utter a word about the conversation. You have to give me an answer now, Richter said. McGuire, flummoxed, glanced to his right. A stranger sat on the couch. The man wore a nice suit and a blue badge denoting him as a CIA staffer. McGuire figured he was a senior agency man. He planted his eyes on Richter's face to read the reaction to his next words. Can I ask a question or two? Richter peered at McGuire sourly. You can ask, he said. McGuire turned to the man on the couch. Who's this guy? I'm Ed Curran, the stranger said. I'm the highest ranking FBI agent inside the CIA. Fuck me, McGuire thought. His mind flew back to Iraq and the troubles there. He had been, uh, I see I can say this to this group, he was op, uh, worked in uh, DB Achilles and so there was a lot of uh, concern at that time that um, uh, though the Clinton administration had been briefed uh, that uh, he and some of his friends uh, who had been involved in that, his co-workers, uh, would ultimately um, be arrested and he was thinking this might be some sort of a ham-handed setup to do that. Uh, moments later, McGuire, excuse me, um, I'm going to read this section. The FBI was still investigating, okay, so McGuire, for, uh, so he figured he could turn down a potentially choice assignment, whatever it was, and retreat to the cubicle dungeon and, dungeon and the slow immolation of his soul, or he could do as the paratroopers say in that instant before leaping out of airplanes. Pull the cord, trust the Lord. Fuck it, he said, I'll take it. Whatever it is, I'll do it. Wise choice, Richter said. McGuire could sense by the tone of his boss's voice that the meeting was over. Curran, no doubt amused by the exchange, gave McGuire orders. Go downstairs to the lobby. Do not talk to anyone and tell no one where you've been. You'll meet a couple of FBI agents at the front door who will give you the instructions. McGuire nodded along. All right. Outside Richter's office, he shot a glance at Anna. She winked. 
So McGuire ultimately is hired. It's a kind of a tricky little process, but ultimately they had a few people that were trying to apply as the deputy branch chief in the, in the CT branch that Jim was heading, which was uh, uh, doing its best to, to cultivate some assets to work against the Wahhabist and the Salafists um, that are so much in the news now. Um, so uh, about this time also, um, he, uh, he gets this job and Jim announces plans to take a vacation to, uh, vacation to Singapore. Um, I'm trying to, I'm reading past the stuff that I, I was trying to dumb down for folks. So anyway, ultimately the Singaporean Intelligence Service is, is allowed to, to run the, uh, after many, many arguments between Ed Curran, the FBI guy, and Paul Redman, who I'm sure everyone in this room knows. <laughs> um, and uh, they argued and argued, and ultimately they called in um, Rich Smiley, um, who was the station chief in Singapore at the time, and he said, no, no, the locals can do this. Um, they're the right people to do this job. And ultimately, um, in the middle of a, of a steamy argument between uh, Redman and Curran, um, uh, George Tennant walks in and, and hears them both out and says, I like Ed's idea, we're gonna do it this way. And ultimately they, um, they let Smiley and Ed um, do that, and they were all having to listen uh, to, the, to the feeds out of Singapore. Um, from the beginning of the investigation, agents uh, and their national security lawyers, Spike Bowman's in the crowd, and <laughs> he's one of the key figures in this whole case, uh, endeavored to build a legally defensible case, and as Spike often says, keep my people out of jail. Um, so with permission from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, uh, the FBI puts Jim under electronic uh, surveillance and physical surveillance. Uh, they rigged a video camera above Jim's uh, desk um, in the tiny little um, acoustics tiles, sort of like these. Um, and uh, we're very careful to take a lot of before and after photographs and um, ultimately uh, wiped away all the little pieces of white dust on Jim's desk and uh, then uh, glued down the ceiling panels so that uh, no, uh, Jim got curious. He couldn't push the panels up um, and find out that there was a camera rigged up there with... Uh, a video line uh, strung by uh, a young FBI tech. Uh, they did a bunch of sneak and peeks, uh, Jim's vehicle at the house. Uh, they went undercover, <laughs> two FBI agents went undercover to buy the townhouse next door to Jim's. There's an amusing story about that in a parking lot, and you can read it in the book. Um, ultimately, they uh, are electronically eavesdropping on uh, Jim, but also watching he and the kids and their movements back and forth uh, so that they can figure out what he's up to. Um, Many agents tailed him all over Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia. A uh, huge uh, team of agents uh, tailed him to a post office uh, in Dunloring, just down the pike here. Um, one evening, uh, this was uh, partly uh, after something uh, Jim had done that afternoon. It's a very amusing part of the story. It involves he and McGuire going for a liquid lunch uh, and um, uh, dropping by the Dunloring post office, and Jim walks in, and he gets back in the van. His minivan was uh, had license plates, 8888 BAT. He signed everything as Batman and still does, as you'll see in some of the later slides, if I can remember to put the slides in. Uh, he still signs his, some of his artwork uh, from the Supermax uh, in Florence, Colorado as Batman. Um, they seized the FBI, uh, finds Jim dropping a, a letter off. Uh, it's to an accommodation address uh, in Africa. And uh, they seize the letter and they find the coded uh, message that's signaling the next meeting. Um, there were a whole bunch of other clever moves. Uh, agents waited uh, over, uh, waited until Jim left for an overseas counterterrorism mission to lift his van off the lot at Langley. Um, this is one of my favorite parts. They actually didn't want the odometer to move, um, and so they pulled in a, uh, a big uh, truck with a winch and lifted the damn thing up and put it on a flatbed and carried it to a Quonset hut and took it apart. They also, they also uh, had bought a, an identical uh, minivan, Dodge minivan, uh, and took it apart so they could figure out where he might have hid things. Ultimately, inside the van they found a laptop choked with evidence. Uh, Jim had prepared a large trove of uh, top secret, uh, secret and other classifications, uh, files, uh, documents that he planned to hand over to his Russian handler. Uh, Mid-November 96, uh, Jim's prepared to leave the U.S. for an authorized counterterrorism mission to Europe, and the FBI decides ultimately this is it's time to roll him up. So let me read to you from the opening of Chapter 7, where Jim's kids uh, 
Star and, and Nathan, Jeremy's off at college at this point, um, are taking him to the airport for a plane he will never catch. Sterling, Virginia, November 16, 1996. Jim steered his minivan to a stop in front of Dulles International Airport and stepped into the brisk sun of a Saturday morning. Rob climbed behind the wheel as his big brother threw his arms around the kids for one last hug. Then Jim was on the move again, striding toward the iconic terminal building with its beveled wall of concrete pillars and glass. Jim turned for an instant and shot them all a grin. He had a way of smiling through his eyes, a glint of pure mirth. He looked like a middle-aged college professor, bearded and bespectacled, dressed in, a white sla in white slacks and a dark turquoise button-down shirt. He carried a suitcase in each hand and a brown leather satchel hung from his shoulder. His kids returned enthusiastic waves as their dad moved for the bank of glass doors. Nathan had turned 12 on the last day of July he had never stayed put in one home longer than three years, accepting Jim's travels and new assignments without question. He was adaptable, cheerful, never tired of adventure. When he grew up, he hoped to be just like his dad. He reminded himself this was a short trip, a week or so, and his dad would be back on his way home with funny tales of foreign travels. The old man had spent less time overseas since taking the new job at headquarters, and Nathan had taken advantage of his dad's presence during those two years in Virginia. They had drawn immensely close. With Jeremy off at college, Nathan was pushing out of his big brother's shadow, asserting himself as Jim's main man. I should point out that Jim did never, never did tell Nathan the secret, and uh, ultimately he found out in uh, a couple of minutes here. As Rob steered for home in the minivan, he made an announcement to distract the kids from their father's departure. We're gonna have a big adventure this week but nothing could prepare them for the adventure that lay ahead. Jim planned a rendezvous in the terminal with two subordinates in his CTC branch who were joining him on the trip. They were set to stop to hop on a 32-seat American Eagle puddle jumper to New York, then jet off to South Africa and Rome on official counterterrorism business. At the end of the business trip, Jim planned to break away for a short vacation in Switzerland to meet with Polyakov, this was his handler. One of, his, one of Jim's suitcases held nothing more than a pair of tan money belts. One he would wear under a pant leg, the other around his waist. Polyakov had promised $50,000 for the new haul. In his camera bag were 10 rolls of exposed but undeveloped film. They held the images of 74 classified documents, some of them st stamped top secret. He also carried two computer diskettes choked with a dozen classified files and an encrypted message for his Russian handler. Jim's wallet held the business card of Roland Keller, his Swiss banker. Jim strode to the American Airlines ticket window and checked his suitcases, then headed through security. He joined his two CIA subordinates in the main terminal and climbed aboard one of the airport's big boxcar on wheels contraptions known as people movers. Moments later, the vehicle pulled to a halt at the midfield terminal where they debarked. FBI agents dressed as travelers folded into the crowd, eyes on Jim's every move. As Jim and his CIA companions neared gate 24, the woman in their party, an Arabic language specialist, suddenly walked off to hit the ladies' room. Up ahead, at the mouth of the gangway, stood a pair of undercover FBI agents posing as husband and wife. Their objective was to wait until the CIA officers entered the passageway and follow them downstairs to the tarmac but suddenly they were the last people standing at the gate. All the other passengers had made their way to the airstrip. They couldn't appear to be waiting for Jim, who might spook him, which might spook him. So they launched into an improvised marital spat that rang in the ears of every agent on the investigation team. The improvisation seemed to work. Jim and his colleagues walked past and the agents shut down their vitriol to quietly fold in behind them. Agent Steve Hooper, who had walked in onto the tarmac a few moments earlier wearing an American Airlines jacket and a blue ball cap with the Dallas Stars hockey logo on it, the, the jacket he had picked up moments earlier, it still had tags on it, he later discovered. He had nonchalantly taken a position on one end of a blue metal baggage cart where a real luggage handler, a lean blonde woman also wearing an airline jacket, stared at Hooper as if he'd just stepped off of a spaceship. Hooper, a former hockey player from Boston with one of those 
thick Tom Selleck mustaches, and this crowd will get Tom Selleck, and some of the other crowds I've talked to will not, um, shot her a reassuring look. Don't worry, he told her. I won't be here long. As Jim reached the ragged queue of passengers on the cold tarmac, he heard a voice. Hey, Hooper called. Jim Nicholson. Jim grinned and took a step forward. Perhaps he thought the stranger in the American Airlines jacket knew him from somewhere or needed to talk to him about his luggage. He was still smiling when Hooper got close enough to flash his credentials. Jim, FBI, he said. It's over. Jim tensed and balled his fist, looking furtively past Hooper. Don't try it, Hooper said. It's over. Dave Raymond, a baby-faced FBI tech agent in jeans and an identical American Airlines jacket, stepped behind Jim and locked hands around his suspect's right arm. Hooper tightened the grip around Jim's other arm. He had arrested all kinds of people in his career, having worked organized crime and Russian mob cases. Most of his targets knew the day was coming, probably even expected it. But Hooper had never seen anyone look quite the way Jim did just then. Stone, frozen, paralyzed. His eyes were vacant. He seemed unable to utter a word. Jim unclenched his fists. There would be no fight, no foot race. Above the action, a member of the FBI surveillance team photographed the moment, frame after frame, documenting the takedown with such clarity you could see the crown of Jim's head had grown a little threadbare. One of Jim's CIA subordinates began to protest as agents guided his boss away from the plane. The officer, the officer explained that they were supposed to be taking an overseas business trip. Canceled, an agent said. Hooper and Raymond handed Jim over to several of the key squad NS-34 investigators behind the day's collar. The three Mikes, as they were known, Lonergan, Donner, and Anderson, received their suspect like a group of hunters accepting a pheasant from a floppy-eared Springer Spaniel. They'd been hiding nearby, watching Jim hike to a plane they knew he would never board. Lonergan, being a counterintelligence counter guy, was a little rusty cuffing suspects. But Hooper had agreed to take Jim into custody only if Lonergan agreed to do the honors and cuff his ass. As Jim assumed the position, hands behind his back, Lonergan swung the cuffs around his wrists expertly. Um, by the arrest, obviously. Uh, and they moved back uh, to be with Lori, who got immediate full custody of the children, as you can imagine. Uh, Lori was more or less employed. Um, and. Um, had a hard time taking care of the kids. Jeremy dropped out of college uh, for a time and, uh, and got a job so that they could support the family. Um, the, um, the government obviously took everything that Jim had earned uh, from the Russians, $300,000 in all, um, that went into a lot of electronic gadgets. Jim was a, a real gadget hound. It really liked uh, fancy stereos and things like that. Um, by mid-November, as Jim prepared to leave the U.S. for an authorized counterterrorism mission, mission to Europe, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading, reading the wrong section here, my apologies. Um, Jim pleaded guilty for his espionage uh, and was sentenced in early 1997 before U.S. District uh, Judge James Kacharis, who probably most of you have heard of or know, um, who presides over the rocket docket there in Alexandria. Um, as is the custom, Kacharis asked Jim if there was anything he might like to say uh, for himself. Um, and uh, in my opinion, uh, Jim has never missed an opportunity to talk about himself. And so I'm going to read just one little short excerpt uh, of, about that moment. When it was Jim's turn to speak, he stood somberly. Those in the front row of the gallery could see he wore dress shoes with no socks. Jim told Kacharis he had lost everything that was ever dear and important to him except his faith in God and his endless love for his children. His actions, he acknowledged, had blotted out all the good things he had done for himself and his colleagues. I won't ask for, for the forgiveness of my colleagues and my countrymen, for I know they cannot give it, he said. I will ask for the forgiveness of my family and children, because I know they will. I reasoned I was doing this for my children, to make up for putting my country's needs above my family's needs, and for failing to keep my marriage together by having done so. I am, in so many ways, so very sorry. Government lawyers and the federal agents who took part in the investigation were flabbergasted by Jim's I did it for the kids speech. Some would recall his words years later as the most destructive guilt trip a dad had ever laid on his child. Kacharis sentenced Jim to the full 23 years, seven months with time off for good behavior. 
Jim could be out by the time he reached retirement age. The judge recommended that the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, uh, his new keeper, uh, serve his time at the prison in Sheridan, Oregon, 50 miles from the courthouse that I cover for the Oregonian. So Nathan answers the door that day when the FBI shows up, a man and a woman, both agents, knocked on the door asking for Mr. Nicholson, and he said, uh, I'm sorry, my, my dad's away on a trip. Uh, and they said, no, we want to speak to Rob Nicholson, your uncle. And so Rob uh, ultimately has to pull the kids aside and say, hey, we're, we're going on a little trip, and they wind up at a motel. The FBI agents are kind enough to let them uh, sneak the cats into the motel, and they put a blanket over the little case. And um, ultimately, uh, um, we fast forward 12 years to the prison in, in Sheridan. Uh, Jim's been allowed to serve his time there, obviously, and he's allowed to spend weekends with his family. Um, the kids and, uh, go to see him every other weekend. Um, and for time, it's all three kids. And then after Jeremy has uh, moved off, um, it's just the two of them, uh, Star and Nathan. Um, Nathan joins the Army after 9-11, uh, incensed about what uh, had been done to our country. Um, he's uh, uh, every bit the patriot that Jim was uh, in his early career. Um, and also wants desperately to be just like his dad. His dad had been a ranger, and he was desperate to become a ranger. Uh, but he has a parachuting accident over Fort Bragg in uh, 2004 and breaks a couple of bones in his lower uh, back, a tailbone area, and, uh, and it, it destroys his Army career. Um, he doesn't make it into the Rangers and, in fact, washes out of the Army. Um, he comes back to Oregon, he's deeply depressed. He had been depressed, he'd been suicidal in fact, um, and so he looks to his father for some help. Um, from the prison visiting room in 2006, as Nathan's working uh, alternately as a Pizza Hut delivery man and uh, also as, a, um, uh, as an insurance salesman, he was a very bad insurance salesman because he, would, he was uh, pitching uh, uh, elderly people on, on policies they really didn't need and they would say, so I, do I need this? And he'd be like, not really. So he made a total of five hundred dollars in sales in in about in about three months or six months that he did this, and ultimately he used that job as a cover uh, for the travels that his father would send him on. So Jim confides this idea that um, he can he can help his family. He can he can carry some messages out of the prison. He can sneak them out through security, and carry them to the Russian consulate in San Francisco. Now Jim does not bother to mention that the San Francisco consulate is one of the most FBI-watched uh, consulates in the world, um, and uh, for obvious reasons to all of you. Um, and um, he doesn't tell him anything other than, look, if anybody stops you, you just tell them that you're, that you're a, an architecture student, you're very interested in the, in the architecture in Moscow. And Nathan is a very naive, naive young man and, uh, and very much wants to make his dad proud. He also feels uh, that he can do something that's uh, sort of exciting and, and sort of walk in his dad's shoes. Uh, his dad's given him some basic tradecraft lessons, um, uh, very basic, um, and um, with the guards watching on there in, in the uh, prison visiting room, which is a, a linoleum shithole. Um, so uh, almost 12 years after Jim has been arrested, um, he sends the Russians his youngest son. Um, Nathan's a lot like his dad. They enjoyed the same things. Uh, they were both Christians. They were both funny, uh, deeply religious people, actually. Uh, but, in, but in one way, they're mirror opposites. Um, uh, Jim wakes every day of his life thinking about uh, Jim. And uh, Nathan uh, is really uh, almost utterly guileless, um, a very decent guy who, who puts everyone else first and always has in his family. And his friends actually say to a fault. Um, and he was willing to carry these messages to the Russians and actually got so into it because his father was exhorting him with biblical quotations, um, Old Testament uh, verses, uh, and he would call Nathan on the cell phone. I have some of the tapes, a lot of the tapes, and he would call him and say, I got a verse for you, and he'd name the verse, and Nathan would be flipping through the Bible that his father had given him on his 18th birthday shortly be he, before he joined the army, and, uh, and Nathan would read it out loud, and oftentimes it was coded language talking about riches coming to them um, uh, in, in the future. Ultimately, Nathan goes to the San Francisco consulate, and um, uh, he's turned away uh, by uh, a, a, a diplomat, uh, in quotations, I think, named uh, Mikhail uh, Gorbunov. And um, I think Gorbunov was probably SVR. Um, and um, 
he says, come back in two weeks. So Nathan comes back. This time, Gorbunov is hugging him. Um, Nathan has presented him uh, in the earlier meeting with a photo of he and Jim together in the prison visiting room as, as proof of, of their relationship, a letter from Jim, and also a sealed message that Nathan didn't read um, that got, went to Gorbunov. Um, suddenly, the Russians, and Mike Rochford is the expert on this, uh, and uh, I defer all other questions about this to him. But um, the Russians uh, are begin tasking Nathan. Uh, they want to know how Jim got caught. Ultimately, uh, they want to find out, you know, who among their ranks betrayed him, uh, and ultimately, they're looking for the mole in their in their own ranks. Um, little did they know uh, that uh, he's already in their custody. Um, Ultimately, Nathan goes to Mexico City. Um, they tell him it's too dangerous to be in San Francisco any longer, so he goes to Mexico City twice and meets with his new handler who identifies himself as George. Uh, this is actually uh, Vasily Fedotov, who um, was a KGB uh, general uh, out of retirement, called in to help service Nathan, who obviously was Jim's agent at this point. Um, Nathan uh, meets twice in Mexico City, then has another meeting in Lima, Peru, um, and Nathan uh, was a Coca-Cola drinker, but in the first meeting, um, he saw that there was coffee and tea available to him, and the, the Russian was offering. He was a little scared, I think afraid he was going to be poisoned. So when he asked what he'd like, he said, I, and he had spotted a closed Coca-Cola bottle in the corner. He says, I'll have Coke. And I don't know if Fedotov and Jim Nicholson had any uh, relationship, uh, or if Fedotov had learned a whole lot about Jim through uh, their files and their, their um, uh, officers. But um, at one point in one of the meetings, uh, one of the foreign meetings, uh, Nathan asks for a, another Coke again, and he says, you're just like your father. Um, I'm still a little perplexed by that. There may be some people in this very room who know the answer to these questions. Um, Nathan understands very little of what he's doing. Uh, he thought this was all old material covered by um, in the newspapers and that sort of thing. Um, didn't realize what he had actually done. And um, so uh, his last trip is to uh, Nicosia, Cyprus in 2008. Excuse me. By then, he is under surveillance by the FBI. Um, they have been tailing him uh, since uh, the middle of 2007. Uh, they've been all the way through his underwear drawers. They've uh, been collecting all kinds of information. Uh, there's a great scene in the book. I shouldn't spoil it, but I will anyway, um, where they have just set up the GPS tracker on his car, and um, the agents are filtering in from a weekend where they hadn't been covering the, uh, the uh, wiretap uh, or any of the electronic surveillance, and they're just bo booting up. They have no idea where his car is, and they boot up the GPS thing, and his, uh, the little blue dot is flashing at uh, Portland International Airport. And so suddenly, <laughs> there's a lot of screaming and hollering. Uh, at the uh, Portland field office of the FBI, and ultimately they go out to the airport and find, yes, he's flown off to, to Lima, Peru, through Houston. So they're waiting for him when he comes back. It's a very interesting scene. Um, so I think what I'm going to do here is just read uh, a portion that really takes you into Nathan's world. This is his uh, final meeting. Uh, he doesn't know this, of course, but his final meeting with uh, Fedotov um, in uh, Nicosia. For sheer whimsy, you had to give it to the Russian. He summoned Nathan ten time zones from home to Nicosia, a city known for its old world cuisine, just to rendezvous in front of a TGI Fridays. Nathan stood on a wide sidewalk as darkness fell over a palm-flecked shopping district choked with Greek nightclubs and restaurants. Towering street lamps bathed them in light as he fidgeted in front of the Texas-based chain restaurant's familiar red and white awnings. He looked for all the world like any other hayseed American tourist, another cultureless Yank who had stumbled into the exotic crossroads of Europe and the Middle East only to forego the local fare and feast on Jack Daniels pork chops, New York cheesecake, and $6 Budweiser's. He wore jeans, sneakers, and a camel-colored baseball cap. The Russian had presented him with the hat at their last meeting, instructing Nathan to wear it outside the restaurant while grasping his backpack in his right hand. He completed the tourist setup with a map of Nicosia, which he snatched from the Hilton's front desk on his way out. When Nathan left the hotel for his appointment, he had launched himself down Arch Archbishop Makarios III Avenue toward the TGI Fridays. He hiked down so many side streets to avoid being tailed 
and he doubled back a few times, pausing at shop windows to check their reflections, making sure he wasn't being followed. Nathan walk, Nathan's walk took such a circuitous route that he blundered off course and got lost. But being the earnest sort, he had left the Hilton so early on the evening of December 10, 2008, that he still arrived an hour early for his meeting with the Russian. He stood on that wide sidewalk trying to look casual as the sun went down on a cool evening two weeks before Christmas. The moon, almost full, shone brightly in the clear island sky. Jim had told his son that his meetings with the Russian were potentially dangerous. Risky, he had said, but not illegal. But Nathan now suspected that couldn't be possibly be true. The evidence, he knew, would show he had smuggled his dad's notes out of the prison then carried them to first name only Russians in diplomatic stations in San Francisco, Mexico City, and Lima. They had paid for the information with bagfuls of $100 bills, $47,000 all told. Both his dad and the Russian had repeatedly cautioned him to keep an eye out for surveillance, and the old man had taught him basic spy skills to avoid detection. It was abundantly clear to Nathan that he and his dad were no longer just father and son, but co-conspirators tempting fate each time he met the Russian. At precisely 7 p.m., Nathan caught a glimpse of a short, gray-haired man walking toward the restaurant. He forced himself to look away until he heard the Russian's unmistakably precise English, words that came almost in a whisper. Do you know the way to the federal post office? Nathan turned and looked at him as if they had never met. His handler stood at five foot six, a couple of inches shorter than he, with white hair, dark gray eyes, and a thick neck. Nathan was supposed to speak his end of the rec recognition dialogue in exchange Russian spies call a parole, but it felt pointless to him. They had now met on three continents, spent hours in soundproof rooms. They were, by anyone's measure, acquainted. But Nathan wouldn't disappoint him. It should be around here somewhere, he said, lifting the prop in his hand, the map of Nicosia. Let me show you the way. Before Nathan could finish the line, the Russian was tugging at his sleeve to move them along. They strode in silence past the Epitopu Cafe toward the sprawling Megaland computer game store and turned left down a poorly lit side street where a dark European sedan hugged the curb. The Russian leaned close. Don't say anything in the car, he said. The Russian opened one of the sedan's rear doors and instructed Nathan to curl himself into the well behind the front seat. Nathan felt the car lurch into gear and pull away. And then I'm going to jump ahead to, to the, the after he's met uh, Fedotov. He's had a, a comical round of reverse haggling with this Russian spy. Um, Fedotov wanted to give him thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars for his troubles on this particular trip, and Nathan, uh, being somewhat earnest and a little naive, um, had had the troubles uh, in the uh, the stop in Houston where he had taken a lot of money and put it in different pockets because he was carrying a little more than $10,000, which of course is illegal. And uh, he didn't want to do that again. And so Fedotov uh, tried to give him $13,000 and $14,000 and Nathan said, no, I can't do that. And the Russian looked at him like he was nuts. I mean, he lived through generations of austerity himself, the Russian had, and now he's looking at this kid who's broke. Uh, wondering what in the hell he's thinking, and ultimately Nathan agrees to take 12000 and then he has to wire some of it to Jim's fiance, in quotes, uh, his former interpreter uh, in Thailand, Kanokwan. So now we have him uh, coming home on the plane, um, and I'll just read this section and I'll probably end it here. Nathan reached Portland International the first hour of Monday, December 15, and slogged to his Chevy. He drove, drove south toward Eugene in a rare snow shower, which threw a brilliant white blanket over the valley. He reached his apartment at 3.30 a.m. and stashed $9,500 cash in his nightstand. Nathan climbed into his rack, knowing his dad would be pleased with the latest payment and with another meeting set for Slovakia the following year. Then he collapsed in the loopy delirium known only to those who have flown halfway around the world in coach. At precisely 1.20 p.m., a loud pounding woke him. He lay in bed for a few seconds, his eyes adjusting to the light. Someone was knocking so hard on his metal door, it reminded him of his sergeants back in the army. Nathan leached, lurched out of bed and lumbered barefoot across the carpet toward the door. The pounding persisted. He pushed an eye against the peephole and saw the fisheye forms of two middle-aged white guys standing on his stoop. 
They were serious looking men in jeans and heavy winter coats. One of them chewed gum. Feds, he thought, had to be. Nathan stood frozen behind the door. For an instant, he thought maybe they would just walk away, hope they would. The gum chewing man pulled out a phone and began to dial. Nathan turned from the peephole and sprinted on tiptoes toward his bedroom. He was closing in on his flip phone when suddenly it rang. He pounced on the silence button before it could ring twice. Then he waited, praying for the men to go away. Moments later, the pounding resumed. The hell with it, Nathan thought. Moving for the door. It's now or never. He exhaled and reached for the doorknob. And so for the second time in his life, FBI agents were on his doorstep. And I don't want to spoil the ending of the book, so I'm going to leave it at that. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Or in fact, I'd like to, to uh, <laughs> ask you some questions, but I imagine that's not going to happen here today in this forum. <laughs> Since I'm standing the closest to the author, I get to ask the first question. <laughs> uh, given what you know of Nathan yes. and the father, do you think if this opportunity were to present itself again, what would Nathan do? Oh, there's no question in my mind that Nathan would tell his father to take a something or other at a rolling donut. I mean, you know, yeah, it would never happen. Uh, Nathan is uh, the judge in the case was so well. You know, I'm gonna, I don't want to give the ending away, but yeah, he would not do it. I'm, absolutely 100% convinced that Nathan ultimately was a stand-up guy who got rolled up and manipulated by a very, very, very uh, coercive man. And uh, David Charney is here, and he and I talked about this at length, the, the, the narcissism of Jim Nicholson. And uh, ultimately, uh, uh, David and I sort of working through it, uh, determined, in fact, for a long time, the, the working title of the book, uh, although it apparently didn't have enough, enough search engine optimization uh, to make the publisher happy, um, my working uh, title was The Last Asset, uh, and uh, I, I thought it would have been a great title, but they said, uh, no. So. They also said that the black cover that I liked <laughs> was not going to be a black cover, so. Uh, it's in the book. At what point did... Uh he teach Nathan the trade craft. Was that done in the prison visiting room? In the prison visiting room. Nathan had had little inklings, little hints throughout his life that his dad was not just some diplomat, not just some government worker that his father was doing. He remembered some uh, details of his dad uh, talking to a friend at a, on a soccer sideline, uh, I think at the farm where he lived. Um, and um, and uh, he was talking about being tailed or, or somebody was tailing him or something. And so there were little inklings uh, of this. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, Nathan learned a little bit of spycraft, but it was all in this uh, linoleum floored, uh, uh, highly secured, well, not so highly secured visiting room. Uh, Nathan, by the way, came up with some terrific ways to sneak those messages out. He was, his dad had come up with some good uh, trade craft, but Nathan figured out some on his own. One of the things he did, his dad was crumpling up, or was, was folding up notes and, and, and um, sleight of handing them into his pocket as he had with Christmas lists over the years. And Nathan said, that's too risky. So he began to devise a scheme where Jim would write his notes uh, for the Russians on uh, the little napkins inside the prison. And Nathan would then uh, take the napkin and crumple it up on the, the, the tray of food that was between them uh, as they visited and snacked on jalapeno cheeseburgers and that sort of thing. And ultimately, Nathan would take the trash uh, where only the visitors could go. The inmates couldn't go past a certain red painted line. He would then um, uh, take the trash and, and, and dump it all but that note, which he would pocket and then carry into the bathroom and then take his shoe off in a stall and put the note underneath, uh, take his sock off and put it underneath the, the sole of his foot uh, and, uh, and carry it out in case they made him take his shoes off going out, not that they would, or, but yeah. It also took a federal judge to get me in that prison and it was about six months before my deadline for the book. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, sir. There are a lot of cases in which naive people have been manipulated and being spies and uh, the case of Sharon Scranage springs to mind. 
why is Nathan in particular more deserving of our sympathy and maybe less punishment? Is it simply because of the fact that his recruiter was a family member? I, I suspect so. I know the judge felt an affinity for Nathan. And in, in truth, um, the two prosecutors in the case I know very, very well, and uh, of course they're in this book too. Um, they thought of him originally as a very hardened young soldier for his dad, and they disliked him. They hated him. They thought he was a bad guy. And as Nathan began to make a series of adjustments in his own life and decide how he was going to, to handle this, and I don't want to spoil it, ultimately um, they got to know him very, very well. Um, and, um, and ultimately they, they came to like him quite a lot. And in fact, um, when Nathan's defense lawyers later came to them and said, we would like to be able to cut off a year of his probation, um, they, uh, the judge wholeheartedly agreed that, and the prosecutors uh, agreed to do that. And so he, yeah, no, you're right. He wasn't, he's not, a, he's, not, uh, he's not a shining white knight here, not by any stretch of the imagination. He was living uh, vicariously through his dad's exploits in a way that he knew at a certain point was absolutely illegal. But by that point, he was in. He was suffering from terrible uh, ulcers, uh, panic attacks, uh, you know, all sorts of sleep issues. Um, and yet, when he was rolled up, when they, when they came in and they interviewed him, they didn't arrest him immediately. They hadn't, they hadn't indicted him yet. The, the FBI came and talked to him. Um, he knew his dad had been sent to the hole. And he knew his dad had been in the hole before for being in trouble. Uh, and so Nathan, feeling bad that his dad was in solitary, began to sleep on the floor of his own house, um, you know, sort of in solidarity, but also because he felt like he ought to be punished. Um, you'll see some things in the book. I don't want to give too much away about that, but, but it gets very well developed. And I, th I think you will find the arc uh, surprising um, of, of his trajectory and then ultimately his feelings about what his dad did to him. Thank you. Fascinating speech. And we have, a, we have a small, small token of appreciation uh, for when you're back in the courtroom in, in Oregon. It's from Smith & Wesson. <laughs> awesome. But yeah. it's, it's a flashlight. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the court security officers will be very happy about that. Thank you again. Thank you so much.